Hello and welcome to the British Sitcom History Podcast. You are about to listen to part two of our discussion of Time Gentlemen, Please. If you haven't listened to part one yet, do go back to our last episode and check that out. We've already talked about where the character came from, a bit of history of Al Murray. We've talked about Julia Sawala already. So you've missed all that. Go back. Go on. We'll wait. Okay, you're back. Great. Now you're up to speed. We can get on with the show in which we're talking about Series 1, Episode 6, Date with Density. We're right in the middle of discussion and we're about to go into a conversation talking about the old man in the pub. If we talk about the old man as well, yeah, who doesn't have a name, <laughs> he's just the old man at the pub. Well, to be fair, Prof doesn't really have a name either, does he? Well, yeah, exactly. And But he he specifically, because in the first episode, I think it is, nobody knows his name. So Janet goes, oh, that's stupid. What, what's your name, old man? And he goes, oh, I prefer not to say. <laughs> yes, he's been drinking there for 40 years. It's like, sometimes you just want to go where nobody knows your name. <laughs> that is a nice line. I like that. <laughs> and at one point, he rings someone up on the phone. He says, oh, tell them to call me back. It's the old man at the pub bit near the chemical works <laughs> like that's his official uh, sort of title so the old man pops as they call him that he was played by roy heather who does have some of a something of a sitcom lineage he is best remembered as playing sid the cafe owner in only fools and horses oh right yeah in you know a handful of episodes you know. That is actually relevant because a director that they brought in to direct uh, seven episodes of the first series of Time, Gentlemen, Please was Gareth Gwenlan, who was the producer of Only Fools and Horses. Ah. And it was him who recommended this guy to play the old man. Uh, so that's where they got him from. Because the vast majority of this cast, you can find a straight line to Richard Herring knew them five years before. Yes. <laughs> so they got cast. But this is an exception. R- Richard Herring knew them five years ago or was sleeping with them. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. The The series as a whole is directed by Gareth Gwynlin and Richard Bowden, who both have, even at that point, a significant lineage. Like I say, Gareth Gwynlin, more as a producer than a director, but he's directed lots of stuff as well. And Richard Bowden had directed all sorts of stuff. Blackadder Goes Forth, he, he directed I, I know that. the name Richard Bowden. I don't know Gareth Gwynlin, but... G- Gareth Gwynlin. The other, the other notable kind of sitcom trivia about Gareth Gwynlin, I know, is that in Red Dwarf, one of the insults that they have... Is a general insult that they, you know, they're making up insults like smeg and, and swear words and stuff, mm. was Gwenlin, like, oh, you're such a Gwenlin. Right. And apparently that came from, I guess, the writers having a bad experience at some point with Gareth Gwenlin, and so they just turned his name into an insult. <laughs> the writer's revenge. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think is quite good. But yeah, he was a very well-respected producer. Just a quick mention of the other the other two uh, regulars who we don't see much of, Leslie and Leslie, who sit in the mm. back of the bar. Yeah, then this is, again, a running joke of two people who are ever-present. They're in every episode sitting there glowering. Do they ever yeah. say a word? Yes, yes, yes. They, for the most part, they are just there, and it's quite nice to have them there, and you can just pull them out for one episode every now and then. But yes, there are a couple of episodes where they're kind of central to the action. So there's one point where Big Leslie, he's in court for something, so he's not right. there. And so Little Leslie is alone, and Terry takes the chance to seduce her right. and asks her to marry him. But then Big Leslie comes back, and obviously uh, there's Hilarity a conflict there. Is. But I think they use them really nicely, actually. They're there the whole time. They just pop them in every now and then. They have the little gag where, you know, if you disturb them, the big fella stands up and they have to throw crisps at him. Crisps at him to calm him. Yes, it's a nice little gag. But it feels, it all feels so basic. Like they've just sat down like, right, what do you always get in a pub? An old man who's been there for his whole life. The drunk propping up the bar. The prof and a big fella with a little lady who yeah. just is a bit violent a bit aggressive you don't yeah. want to make eye contact with him <laughs> yeah the, the big leslie he was like a professional big man like he just played anything where they need someone who was six foot eight or whatever and then the little leslie she's got no other credits at all um, i don't know if she was literally an extra and then they ended up actually giving her some lines that's the dream isn't it alan <laughs> <laughs> Or if she was actually an actor who just has never done anything else. But when she's called on to do something, I think she does it really nicely in, in that character. I, I, she's pretty good. We've left Terry till last because he's the last of yeah. the regulars, but he's actual actor what we have heard of. So <laughs> yes. Phil Daniels. Now, before we talk about the actor, let's talk a little bit about the character, Terry, because I cannot yeah. bear this character. Like he is, that's interesting. you know, he is disgusting. Like that's the whole comedy of it. He, there's the repeated joke of him farting, which is, it's just not funny. 
<laughs> then there's, you know, and he's, he's this lecherous old sod who'll have sex with anyone. You know, he's disgusting. That's the point of him. Mm-hmm. But it just didn't work for me. I just found him repellent. Interesting. You know, in my research, I've been going on forums and stuff and seeing other people talking about this, and that is not an uncommon reaction. Mm-hmm. I, I must admit, I don't dislike him in that sense. I think having someone like Phil Daniels play him is crucial because I think Phil Daniels has a charm and brings a certain something to the character to make it, for me, just over the line of, you know, he's still bearable. Mm. But yes, he is a disgusting character. He's also, you know, after the Gov and Janet, the character that gets the most definition, I suppose. Yeah. There are a few episodes where he's focused on a lot more. So, for example, there's an episode... There's a few formula-breaking episodes where they'll go and do something different. Uh, one of them in a hospital, which I know yes. you've watched. Yeah, we watched that And one. so the regulars aren't in that, but Phil Daniels is. That's the character they, they pull along. They find a way to get him in there. And then there's another episode where Terry turns up in the middle of the night, knocking on the door. The Gov lets him in. And then it becomes this episode between just him and the Gov. They're having like a heart to heart. And Terry comes in and basically says, my mum's just died and I'm really upset. And then Janet comes in and she's involved. And it's just the three of them in the episode. It's a, yeah, like I said, formula breaking episode, but it works really nicely. It's mm. still within character. And it actually gives Phil Daniels a chance to do proper acting. And he does a little bit of emotional in there, uh, even though it is still the same sort of grotesque character. And it's a nice, it's a nice little episode. It is, it's a nice as a one off as yeah. a break from the rest of it. Perhaps having seen that, that helps sort of humanise the character a little bit somehow, maybe. Or, yep. But even so, he's, he's much the same, <laughs> you know. I think we disagree on this because, you know, he's obviously, like I say, he's a disgusting character. For you, it worked. <laughs> for me, it just didn't. Yeah, OK, fair enough. <laughs> but Phil Daniels then, this was an interesting a thing proper actor. I just thought of. Like, yeah, like if I was to say to you, what is Phil Daniels? Like, what would you, what, what are the credits you would have? Quadrophenia. Quadrophenia is the thing for me. I know that's probably very yeah. early in his career. Was he in EastEnders yeah. later? Yeah, he was for about 2008. That's that way after my time. For, for a couple of years, yeah. But yeah, I think of him as Quadrophenia. I am one of the faces. He's a, a, a young, cool mod in that film. Or a wannabe, at least. The other thing, I, I mean, this shows my age. The other thing I think of him is he's in the Park Life video. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think I would say the same. Quadrophenia and Park Life for me. <laughs> That's what I know him from. But he is a proper actor. Yeah, yeah. And he was, he had quite a bit of success when he was young, like Quadrophenia. He's in Scum as well. Uh, mm. And he was uh, uh, in a few other things at that time. Kind of had a bit of a wilderness period where he was work, but he was always working. Yeah. You know, perhaps not quite as forefront. Well, well listen, I remember when he was in that Park Life video. So what, that would have been 96, 97? And he was, he was, it was, oh, it's Phil Daniels off of Quadrophenia. That was, that was, yeah. it, that, you know, it was 10 years, oh, no, God, more than that. 15 years after Quadrophenia. But he was still Phil Daniels from Quadrophenia. Yeah, but he's, like I say, he's always been working, done stage work as well. Yeah. And yeah, I, after those two things, I would probably point to Time Gentleman Please as the thing I know Phil Daniels from. Blimey. <laughs> so. Yeah, but as we've established, nobody saw it. So, so that's just you. That's just the sitcom aficionado. Back to the episode. As we established earlier, we got the Terry Brooks three-step method for wooing a lady, which mm-hmm. is to say, oh, I like your hair. And then, and then go, what do you like? Oh, really? I like that thing too. And then, uh, absolute last resort, I love you. And so... <laughs> it's a flawless plan. <laughs> he teaches this. He teaches this to the Gov. There's a nice little comedy scene doing that. Yeah. And then, obviously, we get a call back to it later when he actually tries it. And yeah. it goes horribly wrong. Mm-hmm. Of course. This is the Gov that I want. The, the Gov that at the start of this episode... Mm-hmm. He's confident. He's in charge of his pub. He has this boisterous nature. Yeah. And you can't touch him. Any question you've got, he's got the answer. Regardless if it's correct or not. The bird at the checkout, the catch and carry. Tina, I've been working on her for months. Slowly, slowly, catch him, monkey. <laughs> today, 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 she finally actually spoke to me. What did she say? Do you want a receipt? <laughs> Result? She wants it. She wants it. But then, when running my fingers over the receipt, her token of love and sniffing it for her delicate perfume, I noticed the cheeky coward shortchanged me. Oh, that's a good sign. She pleaded with me not to tell her boss, and I said I wouldn't as long as she promised to come out with me tonight. Oh, what a shit house thing to do, you mongrel. You just don't understand women, do you, Janet? Um, but then, you know, because it's a comedy character, he gets knocked down. It's like, oh, God, the date's going badly. What am I going to do? That's what this character should be. It's, that is the perfect encapsulation of this character. Unfortunately, that's not what we get in every episode. Okay. 
And specifically in the second series, the whole thing running through the series is that he's lost it. He's lost his mojo. He he's got his barman's hands. Barman anymore. Yeah. Look at me. Don't look at me. Look at me. Don't look at me. <laughs> that gets repetitive. <laughs> yeah, there is a lot of humour to be had there. But I think it really affects the character in a way that you don't want it to. Yeah. I think it knocks him down and he's no longer the central pillar of the show. And that is one of a few things that is wrong with the second series. Well, you think of the, the, the strength of the character is his indomitable self-confidence. Yes. And so, yeah, if, you're, if you give him too much vulnerability, it undercuts that. Yes. And, and the beauty of that is because he has so much confidence, every week something knocks that back. Something yeah. knocks him down and he has to win it back again. So in this case, it's, you know, struggling to, to get a lady in bed, you know. And the subplot with Janet and Steve is going on. And so they find some excuse to bring in Uncle Barry to look after the bar while, uh, while the gov is on his date. So I want to talk about Uncle Barry, or I believe at this point he's just Barry. I, I think they right. hadn't decided to do the whole uncle, possibly your dad yeah. uh, thing. In fact, in this episode, I think it's the first time where he goes on about how he used to be a sex addict and uh, had an affair with the Gov's mum, who, yeah. wa- who was uh, his uh, brother's wife. That's definitely mentioned in this episode. because I've, I've Yeah, I've but I think that's the first seeding of that idea which never really goes anywhere it's just like in the later episodes it goes oh it's the least i could do for my uh, nephew yeah in a very kind of clunky way very clumsy yeah it never comes to any kind of realization or anything who's playing uncle barry who's that it's barry gosney who you may recognize from harry hill show yes because he played the kind of weird little old man who they got to do stuff that you wouldn't normally get that person to do like he'd always be the one dressed up as, you know, a mermaid or something. I remember. Good family fun. That's obviously a direct line. They've gone, oh, we'll, we like him. Let's get him in. They got him in for one episode. That was the original idea. And they liked him. So they went, okay, let's, we can pull that character in. Yeah. And then came up with a whole, that storyline with him. Now, I'm okay with that. I will say that, you know, this guy has got quite a long career of small credits going back decades. I, I don't know. I, I mean, he's not an actor. I mean, what is he doing here? It's not... It's not good acting, is it? It's not. It's really not. He's not acting that. He's not doing bad acting deliberately. He's just a bad actor. What he's doing is he's doing the funny old man in Harry Hill dressed up as a, yeah. a pub landlord. Yes. It's like a variety show turn, isn't it? Well, in my younger days, I was a bit of a shagger. <laughs> Sexaholic, if you will. Couldn't get enough. My brother's wife was a very accommodating lady. Oh, yes, she was. <laughs> I mean, from what I can tell, they, they just keep him around because he's a lovely bloke. He, he used to drink with Robert Mitchum in the 60s <laughs> and he's got all these great stories. And the only joke they've got is that, you know, he's got boot black on his hair and then yeah. there's always some contrived way of getting liquid on him so it falls yeah. down his face. Brilliant. Which in itself is a kind of like, look, this setup is so obvious that it's a crap joke and we're acknowledging it. But yeah, at what point does that just become a crap joke? Yes. Tell us about the Gov's date and how that goes. Okay, so yeah, the, the woman from the cash and carry turns up and at first just seems like she's a normal, nice woman. <laughs> they go to the snug to have their private date and uh, he tries his line. He tries, he says, I like your hair. It goes all right. And then, so obviously he's going to say, what do you like? And then just agree with whatever she says. Tina, what do you really like? Hmm, I don't know. I suppose I really like a man with a tight ass. Oh, really? I really like a man with a tight ass too. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's it. That Al Murray as the pub landlord. I guess we haven't really talked about his characterization. It is very over the top. It's very yeah. caricature, but it works in the context of how he's doing it, and it is something that. He has been done f- with that character for ages. And the character is so much more rounded because he's obviously been doing it for years. Mm-hmm. So I think it really works. And I think that obviously sets the tone for the rest of the show. Mm. It's slightly hyper-realistic. It's all pitched at cartoon level, isn't it? It's cartoon, yeah, yeah, cartoon. They stray too far with that occasionally. But for the most yeah. part, they're getting away with it. And uh, But yeah, so... The date's going well. She's complains about being hot, so he has to take her upstairs. Mm. You know, we don't know at the time, but she's just trying to finagle her way into his bedroom. Yeah. So we go upstairs, and 
even in 2000, raping an unconscious woman was too far. <laughs> and they knew that. But it's okay. Even Richard he... Herring knew that. <laughs> 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 but even the pub landlord knows that's too far. But then we have a moment with Steve in the chimney. But basically, you know, the woman eventually gives up on the gov making a move and says, look, are you going to shag me or what? And then the, pu- the, the boiler blows up. And uh, because he uses her as a human shield to protect himself from the boiler blowing up, that puts a bit of a damp squib on the whole date thing. (laughs) But it is a nice climax to the show, using the word climax very carefully there, because it is the the culmination of everything we've been building up to. It's a nice tie-in of the two Mm storylines. And ultimately, the Gov is still frustrated. He doesn't get his end away. Yeah. Uh, and, And that's the episode, really. There's not like a really lot to explore in it. Like I said, I, I picked it because it was a lovely structure to it. I think you've done a good job of selling that to me. I see I see what you mean about the, the, the two broad strands have come together at the end there, and it is well structured. But but you know, there's no there's no deep meaning to it, is there? It's it's nah. pretty. You know, we we don't want to oversell it. And it doesn't have to be. It's all right. It's a sitcom. Well, look. Let's. I think I think we've kind of drained all the juice out of that episode. So yeah. what, there's a couple of other things I think we should talk about. Um, well, a couple of other characters. There's Rebecca Front's character from the brewery. And mm-hmm. also the second series, we have Connie, who replaces Janet as the barmaid. Uh, yep. Presumably because Julia Swallow and Richard Henry fell out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so one of the other regulars, Rebecca Front, she is the, the representative of the brewery. Never pulled a pint in her life. You know, she's the authority figure that is the conflict. You know, she comes in mm. and and, Al, uh, and the pub landlord has to deal with what she's doing, which is obviously she's doing things that do not conform to what his idea of a proper British pub should do. But I must say, I really, really like this character. And I think that is in a large part down to Rebecca Front. I think mm-hmm. she's perfect. And again, I want to qualify. The second series does not work anywhere near as well. But in that first series... She's just so desperate to be liked. Yes. And, you know, someone will say something and then she'll it'll remind her of a line from a song and she'll sing a line from the song. Oh, oh, you remember that song? And I, like, no. And, <laughs> and, and she keeps going. She keeps going yeah. beyond the point of where it's uncomfortable and they're all just staring at her. It's really funny. Really funny. <laughs> so I, I like that. That's a repeated gag that they do a lot. And again, by the second series, maybe it's just because it's getting old or maybe it's because they try and do too much with it. Whatever, but... The, and the way the gov interacts with her. So at the beginning, he's like, you know, she she insists on being called Ms. Jackson, you know? And then she comes along. Yeah, now about that, Ms. Jackson. Oh, please call me Vicky. No, no, Ms. Jackson. Oh, well, Miss Jackson then. No, no, Ms. <laughs> I know what it's like nowadays. I call you Miss. Next thing I know, I'm up in front of an industrial tribunal on a charge of sexual harassment. <laughs> Back off, Brussels! <laughs> He's angry at her political correctness, but he, he he needs to have that so that he's got a reason to hate her. Yeah, but you can tell she's a feminist, you know. Trousers, job, it's the full package. <laughs> Classic. <laughs> so so I, I like that dynamic and Rebecca Front is magnificent as she generally is. I think there's a I think that's really well observed though, because obviously, you know, she is, as you say, everything the landlord hates. But he is a caricature of that bluff lord of his domain this is my my pub i'm in charge i'm at the bar pontificating and everything revolves around me but ultimately if you manage a pub then you have to answer the brewery and you're you're not really lord of your own domain you, you know you have yeah. to pay lip service and he's not running a successful pub either <laughs> exactly <a> crap pub <laughs> uh yeah so but rebecca front then uh she goes yeah. back to Ox- oxbridge university wherever that is and she went through the usual process. Contemporary of Armando Inucci, which is obviously going to get you places. <laughs> See, I, nice think, I think the first time I came across Rebecca Front was was early Alan Partridge. When he, when he did Knowing Me, Knowing mm-hmm. You, which was yeah. a spoof chat show, she was a regular guest. She'd play a different guest each week. Uh, yes, that's probably the first thing I knew her from as well. But obviously she was doing radio. She, I think On the Hour was probably happening. Well, it must be Alan Partridge. Um, yeah. Before Alan Partridge. She had done The Inexplicable World, uh, of, Lionel of Lionel Nimrod, Nimrod. which was a four-piece thing. Leon Herring, Rebecca Front, and Armando Iannucci. Like, that's quite something, you know, all yeah. sort of before they hit their peak, I suppose. What year was that? 92 or 3? Or... Yeah, that sounds right. So I was th- back, that's when I was listening to, you know, we didn't have Spotify kids. I was listening to Radio 1, and um, they would have a regular comedy strand. And 
Fist of Fun was that, but I think I think Lionel Nimrod might have been before Fist of Fun. But certainly, I remember you know I remember I remember thinking, oh, I must listen to the radio tonight. Lionel Nimrod's on. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so that that ages me. Interestingly, uh, uh, Rebecca Front has cropped up in my research for this sitcom before because uh, when I was researching Jonathan Morris, he his gotcha on Noel's house party was like oh, it's apparently it's one of the best gotchas ever. It's like a classic, and it's on YouTube. I watched it, and the whole point of it was that this pregnant woman is like, oh my God, I'm, I'm going to labor and, and it's a whole panic and he has to help deal with that. And the pregnant woman was Rebecca Front. Wow. And it was like, oh, well, she can't have That's been a gig. famous at all at the point, at that point, can she? Because <laughs> the yeah. whole point is that he yeah. thinks it's a real person. And like, sure. uh, so yeah, interesting to see her so, so long ago. So, and, and she's done loads of serious stuff as well, which makes yeah, sense. Yeah, well, let's ask about that, because when, when I think about Rebecca Front, I basically think of everything you just said, all the Amanda Yanucci stuff, all the Steve Coogan stuff, and she's part of that, that troupe. Mm. What else has she done outside of that world? She was in Lewis for a while. She was definitely okay. in that for a bit yeah. as a regular. Poldark, she's a regular in Poldark. Uh, loads of stuff. She's a jobbing actor, basically. And I think yeah. she's best yeah. known for comedy. But even in the comedy stuff you see, she's often the straight man. Like, um... But that says, that says a lot about, about me. I know her from the, the, the things that have not been seen by as many million eyes. But that I'm, <laughs> you know, that, that I'm a comedy fan. Whereas, you know, I would imagine more people watch Poldark than watch In the Thick of It. Mm, yes, yeah, probably. I've never seen Paul Dutt. Okay, so when the series got extended by nine episodes, you know, Rebecca Front went, well, you know, I'm mm. pregnant. It will be showing, like, by that point if we do an extra nine weeks. <laughs> so oh. so then they wrote into the plot uh, that she was pregnant. And I, I will say wrote it in really nicely. There's It's seeded in, like, as early as episode seven or something. And then the next time we see her, she's in hospital. And the gov mistakenly thinks she's dying. But then the episode where it's all revealed, she comes in, something happens, something happens, something happens, and then it's like, oh my God, she's pregnant. If you've only seen that episode, it still works. So in that sense, that yeah. seeding is just a nice sort of additional thing without yeah, without being necessary. a problem. And I think that helped uh, Richard Herring when he was writing those episodes to have a couple of through line plots that he could work on. And it suddenly gave him this whole thing. Who's the dad? And and that's the that's the subject of a couple of episodes where they're trying to figure out mm. who the real dad is and and so you know it was perfect for him because it, it he had some fodder to get these extra episodes out. Yeah. Well, what about probably the the next biggest character is Emma Pearson who takes over from Julia Sawala in the second series as Connie, who's a yes. student <laughs> yes. instead of an Australian who are you know bred for bar work she's a student who the gov hates but they're all completely intimidated by her as well so she slots straight into that role yeah i think they do quite a nice job of bringing a, a totally different character in there but still managing to kind of fill the gap although i say that fill the gap i mean i think julia sawala is a huge miss in that second series i think that's yeah. one of the problems with it uh as a character i think it suffers from being a bit unfocused which, again, I think is true of the whole entire second series. Yeah. It's not quite sure what she is, what she's she's trying to be, what she is to the Gov, how he's responding to her. And obviously his response is confused. Like, that's kind of the point. <laughs> he was never confused. <laughs> but, yeah. but even that, just it's not quite sure, like, what he wants from her and... Mm. The whole thing's just a little bit messy and it never quite works for me. I don't know. And then you get, you get the jokes about students. Like, you don't understand. I've got to write this. I've got to finish this essay by May. Like, and it's like not 0.3% of my exam. <laughs> yeah. I liked all that. But yeah, that's it's just, it, it, it was always just a bit flimsy. And I, yeah. you know, I don't particularly like Emma Pearson much. I don't think she's very good, frankly. I mean, I haven't well, seen look, her. I'll tell you what I will say, and I don't want to be too shallow about this, but she, she looks, I know, I know it's made just after, it's, well, it was 2001, but she's got that classic 90s look. She's the, it's Loaded Magazine. It's FHM. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. That's why it makes me feel unusual. And to be fair, I haven't really seen her anything else. So I, don't, I can't judge her that harshly. But in this, I don't. She was in Hotel Babylon, she. wasn't she? That seems to be what she's best known for. See, that yeah. feels to me like a lot more recent, but I'm guessing it was only two or three years after this, wasn't it? 2008, I think it was. Yeah, off the yeah. Top of my you head. see, yeah. this, is, this is that compression of time problem. Everything that's not when I was 25 feels like last week. <laughs> but yeah, she started out young. Obviously, she was, a, she was in Grange Hill as a teenager. And uh, okay. just the year before this, she was a regular in a sitcom called Beast, which was about Alexander Armstrong as a vet. Uh, and she no, was I've a regular. Not, I've not even that. heard of that. And then 
in the same year as this, she she was in she was in the Armstrong and Miller show a few appearances, and then a few years later, she was in the Worst Week of My Life, which is a Ben Miller led sitcom. So she was obviously right. in with them, like she's mates with them. Uh, so that's yeah, Emma Pearson, and I I think it's another element that's lacking in the second series. She's not Julia Sawala, I guess is the point I'm making. Yeah, I want to mention one other character who is a regular. That is Greg Thompson. Greg Thompson, the rival from the pub up the road. Yes, who does appear in quite a few episodes. Yeah. And again, it's another character that I think they use really well. He just pops in. He's a total arrogant dick. He does the same sort of shtick every time. Oh, dear, Slops. Is that a weed on your bar? Oh, my mistake. It's your Christmas tree. (laughs) (laughs) Laugh. Laugh, everyone, at Mr Thompson's witticism. Uh, Personally, I've got a 50-footer. And my Christmas tree's pretty big and all. (laughs) I'm implying I've got a massive cock. (laughs) But it works. (laughs) It's it's kind of just there every time. And it's such a great kind of foil for the the pub landlord. I mean, the the real problem with it is that the pub landlord is so kind of obsequious and, and, and scared of him. Yeah, there should be a, I, if, it should be a bit more of a head-to-head rivalry. I mean, you know, this character is Johnny off EastEnders. So yes. I obviously used to watch EastEnders back then. Yeah, uh, in the late nineties, I guess, because he's he's Johnny from EastEnders, and that's uh, it's the same character essentially with a with a burgundy blazer on. <laughs> yeah, Mark Bannerman is the actor, and uh, yeah, this was about the time he was finishing EastEnders. I'm not sure if there was a crossover or anything. And has he done anything since? Eh. I wouldn't have thought. So, well, uh, yes, he's working, but perhaps not that much. And I think he's great in this. I think he's just perfect for that character. He seems so realistically nasty. Like, I believe that he's like that, (laughs) which I'm sure is testament to his acting skills. But the bit where, like, he's got his own son and and the son, like, tries to hug him. He's like, get off my air. And it's it's so vicious and so angry. And, And obviously it's just this horrible, sexist, misogynist character. But he plays it really well. And, and it's, a, it's another example of where they use the supporting characters really well. We've covered everyone except Richard Herring, really. We've mentioned him a lot. <laughs> well, we talked about him a lot, yeah. So, it, it, so I, I, you know, as I said earlier, I've got a lot of affection for Richard Herring. I listen to a lot of his podcasts. I used to stay up to listen to him on Radio 1 nearly 30 years ago. What, I think my problem with Richard Herring is that I'm not a massive fan of his scripted work. I really love his improvised stuff. I, I love his like his interview podcasts. I think they're great. I, I like him. I like his personality, his comedic personality. But pretty much all of the scripted sitcom and sketch comedy that he does, I just think, well, I'm not really. I don't really like this very much, despite <laughs> my affection for him. Do you know? I've had a bit of a thing because I'm similar. Like I've certainly in the past, I've been like, oh yeah, I like Richard Herring. I'm a Richard Herring fan. I think I might have even seen him live. I've definitely got a couple mm, of his books and etc. Yeah. I used to listen to his podcasts, but I used to listen to his podcasts. And at some point, and I don't even know when it was, so it was obviously quite a while ago. I let them go. I stopped listening and I'm not exactly sure why that is. Oh no, I feel bad about that. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I'm genuinely, I'm feeling quite defensive. I've got genuine affection for the guy. I really like him. But do you know what, right? Honestly, I can go back and watch This Morning with Richard Not Judy and I find it absolutely hilarious. And the fact that it's all kind of crap and thrown together is yeah. part of its charm. Definitely. And I think you can get away with that when you're in your 20s and you're playing to a <laughs> student crowd. Well, you can't when you're in your 40s. And, you know, I, I do what I do really like about Richard Herring is that he, he does put so much of himself into his work. So mm. he's done a whole thing about turning 40 and, and he's done a whole thing about having a family and like how that's changed his life and, and the extra responsibility is that. I, I like all that stuff. I do respect him and I certainly respect him as, a, as an entertainer, but I just don't think I like his stuff enough to get into it. If I could it. build on what you said there, so you, that ramshackle seat of the pants stuff is all right when you're 20, but not when, when you're in your 50s. I, I would say... It's all right when you're in 20s. It's all right when you're in your 50s, but it's not all right when you're doing a scripted sitcom. It's a different, it's a different yeah. dynamic. I also heard him being interviewed about his podcast, and he, and he basically said, yeah, it's slapdash. I know it's slapdash. And he said, when people come to see me do stand-up, they're surprised by how good it is and how well-structured it is because they think yeah. I'm slapdash. And I think, yeah, if your main kind of advertising tool, your main thing that you're putting yourself out there every day is slapdash and thrown together and improvised. That's the that's the reputation you're building. Sure. I also think that he spreads himself so thin. 
He he does so many yeah. things. A- again, in a way, I respect that because he's just trying things. And he, he obviously embraced podcasting very early on as just a way of yeah. trying new things. I'm going to do a semi-entertainment slash art podcast where I play myself at snooker. Yeah. And, it, and it's just a sort of... And it's a weird thing to listen to because it just becomes this strange man discovering his own mental illnesses <laughs> through, through a range of characters that he's inventing. And it's a really strange thing to listen to. And I respect that as a kind of art... But yeah. that doesn't mean I enjoy it. I know what you mean. So that's kind of where I am with Richard Herring at the moment. I'm not interested in seeing what he does, but I'm like that he's doing it. But I, I, I am, I am feeling. This is what is this the sixth podcast we've recorded? This yeah. is the most uncomfortable I have felt about <laughs> being unkind about someone. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. And it's not because I think he's. <laughs> you might hear this. It's because I, I really like the guy. You know, I really do, and. I, <laughs> Like I can quite happily slag off Peter Howitt's Scouse accent because you know, who cares? <laughs> but but I feel like I know Richard Herring because I've I've listened to so much of his material over yeah. thirty years, and yeah, I'm, I, this is really uncomfortable for me. <laughs> That's interesting. I had a very similar feeling because I made a lot of kind of armchair psychiatrist <laughs> conclusions about Richard Herring just based on what I've read and what I've seen of him and his podcasts, yeah. etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I was just like, I don't know if I feel comfortable just sort of blurting that out. And I certainly need to put a lot of codifiers on it. <laughs> yeah. um, there's so much of him out there that it's exposing. And the fact that I feel like I've got a good read on him, which is probably largely incorrect, um, mm. is, is, is somewhat unfair. And, and this is something I've seen him say with Time Gentleman, please. He put so much work into it. He put his heart and soul into it. It was the hardest thing he's ever done. And nobody watched it. The critics didn't care. Mm. There was no audience. Mm-hmm. And it was, a, I think it hit him really hard. And it yes. would, of course it would. And just things like he tried stand up when he was younger and just did, wasn't that good at it. And so he just didn't do stand up for 10 years. And then, mm-hmm. you know, he, he did a show every year for 10 years. Like once he got into it and he was suddenly he was like, oh no, I'm good at this. I can do it. And so he was a stand up and he was a really yeah. good stand up who had a great reputation. He does have a great reputation. You know, uh, like I listened to his Leicester Square Theatre podcast where he interviews other comedians and. He gets guests from across the comedy world, different ages, different levels of success. He's incredibly well respected within that community. Yeah. I think just to finish up, uh, I mentioned this earlier about this idea of the pub landlord character and where he sat within that, 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 that ironic sexism, ironic racism type comedy, which was very, very popular back then. You know, it follows on, I think it, it came out of uh, the sort of laddish culture, the men behaving badly type culture yeah. of the 90s. It was a reaction to that. And it was a kind of, you'd got alternative comedy and all that. Well, it was called PC then. They call it woke now, don't they? But that, that <laughs> culture coming in, you'd got the, the backlash of laddishness. And then there was Al Murray, maybe Jimmy Carr, those types of people who were, who were telling the old fashioned jokes that were pre-political correctness, but they were doing it with that nod and the wink and they were saying, it's okay, you're not laughing at the jokes, you're laughing at me, you're laughing at this this sad old man who's making these jokes. And, yeah. and, and, and you could kind of get away with it. My question is, how has comedy moved on since then? And would that be possible now? I, I, I don't think so. I think watching it now, I... I didn't think, oh my God, I can't believe they're saying that. How did they get away with that? Oof, God, 20 years ago, it was a different time. I think it's still played for me. I, I agree. I don't think it's like, you know, when we watch Rising Damp and cringed a little bit at some of the things they were, some of the homophobic things they were saying, some of the racist language. It's, it's nothing like that. Yeah, because like, for, to, to, well, to use that for an example, R- Rigsby in, in Rising Damp is racist. Perhaps only casually racist in the in the norms of the seventies. Like he wasn't like a vicious, but he's got all these racist ideas, and we present that as a character. Okay, well he's a fool, so he has foolish ideas. Hmm. Whereas this is different. It's not. Yes, the character is a fool. He has foolish ideas. The pub landlord, but there is a much more knowing wink to camera. I am yeah. an actor, and I know what I'm doing. Kind of character to it, yeah. and that is as. That is the difference between writing a character that does bad things and having an ironic character. Yeah. There is a line there. Obviously, there's some sort of balancing act doing there. And you can do it wrongly. Mm. Uh, but I think uh, the pub landlord has consistently been able to straddle that line for yeah. 25 years. I agree. I think Al Murray is... I, 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 when, does he still perform as the pub landlord? Because... I, I doesn't feel like too long since I last saw him. But but again, you know, that compression of time, it might be 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I don't know if he's been officially retired, uh, but there's no kind of he did, he did quite a lot of mainstream stuff. He had an ITV chat show, didn't he? Yeah. There was a, a quiz show called Fact Hunt that was obviously based Fact on Hunt. the thing, which was like a pub quiz style thing presented mm-hmm. by the pub landlord. Then they had Al Murray's Happy Hour, which was like a, yeah, a primetime ITV, like trying yeah. to rival Graham Norton sort of show. Yeah. And as far as I know, that did really well. And, and they did like an audience with Al Murray and all that sort of I, thing. I, like I he tell was you getting what, I the mainstream more people treatment. watch that chat show than watch this. Oh, Time, yes, gentlemen, yeah. please. But then it, it only did like two series and that was that. He had another quiz show, which was essentially the same concept called Compete for the Meat, um, <laughs> which I think was... I mean, wait, that's funny. I think I think he had celebrities on there, and they had to do like stupid tasks and things like that. Right. And it was just hosted by Taskmaster him. before Taskmaster. Well, maybe. Well, I don't know about that because when I looked on it, the first name I saw in the credits was Chris Akabusi. So I think that sort of sets the <laughs> level. You know, it wasn't like Frank <laughs> Skinner an and, and Richard yeah. Herring <laughs> doing stuff. So yeah, that that character has you know consistently been doing things and perhaps never quite made the kind of Lily Savage breakthrough character <laughs> breakthrough yeah. role, but has had that mainstream that time yeah. in the limelight. And of course, the ultimate, the the last refuge of any scoundrel, uh, any attention seeker, he stood in the general election. Of course, he um, did. Yes, as the pub landlord. Yes. That's that's the last. That was his last hurrah. So when was that? Was that twenty fifteen? It was 2015, yeah. Stood against Nigel Farage. He stood against Nigel Farage, yeah. And I've heard him talk about that a lot. And obviously Mm. the motivations for doing that were mostly just to take the mick. It it seemed like an interesting thing to do, you know, an interesting experience. And they got some comedy fodder out of it. Yeah. He he only got 318 votes. um, But but, but Alan, perhaps (laughs) that's... That's a nice way of rounding off my question about is this character still viable in, you know, 20 years on? He's become Nigel Farage, hasn't he? That's the problem. So in twenty, in two thousand, two thousand and one, this sort of bluff, racist. I, I, you know, I say what I like. I like what I say. He was a comedy character. He was the guy at the bar you could all have a laugh at. Hmm. Now he, you know, he's the leader of UKIP. Yeah. And he's on Newsnight. Yeah. Oh my God, I've depressed myself there. <laughs> <laughs> how about this for a, how about this for a tenuous, um, tenuous link? I've made some notes about this, and I'm not sure if it's if it's nonsense. The demise of the pub landlord as a parallel for the demise of the British pub. Okay. See, I was a I was you know, a dedicated pub man in the year 2000, right, and yeah. pubs are not what they were. You know, every most estates used to have a pub, and they've all gone. That was the, that was the sort of pub that the pub landlord was was running. I, I was looking up, you know, the the two things that are generally held to have hasten the demise of the British pub are the smoking ban and and just wider availability of alcohol in supermarkets. Right, yeah, okay. I noted that this would be pre-smoking ban because nobody's smoking. Well, I, I, I put that as a note as well because my, if you'd have asked me before I you know, did this bit of cursory research, I would have suggested that the smoking ban was around about this time, 2000, 2001. And actually it wasn't. It was in 2007, which I was amazed at. It must be later than that. I went to university... In 2008, and I remember, I know for a fact, going to clubs in Leeds, pubs and clubs in Leeds, and having to leave just because I'm not a smoker and my eyes were stinging and my throat was hurting and like that kind of post being in a smoky room kind of feeling. Mm. And I just like, I hate it. I don't do pubs and clubs really. And that's one of the reasons. And so that was definitely 2008 at the very latest. Uh, very. But latest. I can remember that, that, that smell. You would come home from the pub, even if you'd just been for a one pint and you know your clothes were written off they had to be washed because they just stank and then when you know after the smoking ban pubs that that smell went but it was but then you were just left with this smell of stale beer and despair (laughs) it it really it really took something away from the pub experience it it really did i I mean it 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 took passive cancer away from the smoking experience i'm not saying it's a bad (laughs) thing but i am saying that it completely changed the experience of going to the pub irrevocably Mm. And so people started staying home. As I say, it became cheaper and easier to get a much bigger range of alcohol at the supermarket. Home entertainment got better. You know, we we already talked about the, the rise of digital TV. There was just less incentive to go to the pub. And I really think they lost their status as centres of the community. Well, I know like in the village I grew up in, there was four pubs and now there's none. You know, I think, mm. oh, I think the, you know, the working man's club's still there or whatever, but... Mm. But now people don't live in the village anymore. You know what I mean? Yeah. They live in the village, but they don't 
have their lives in the village. You go out to town and you get a taxi back. Uh, you yeah. know, you you do other things. Lives aren't quite as small, you know, in that like yeah. village life sense. I think that we have we all have our community. If you go back even twenty or thirty years, your community was 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 your geographical community. It was the people who lived near you, and you would meet them at the pub. Whereas now we have digital communities. You know, wh- whatever you're into, you'll be in some Facebook group, and you'll have friends who you can talk to about that, and that will be your community. Yeah. So my point is that the local pub has died, and with it that character of the pub landlord, of which Al Murray's character is a caricature. I guess I haven't really thought about this that much, but I watched Al Murray, the pub landlord. I find it amusing, but I have no point of reference for that. I, I mean, I don't go I, I don't go to pubs mm. much anyway. And the pubs I go to, the person behind the bar is just someone doing a, a you know, a four hour shift. And they're like, oh yeah, right, what do you want? They're not the person who owns it. You know, they're not the landlord. And well, that's interesting because that again, this is our age difference. You're younger than me, but you know, I as I say, I was a I was a pub man in the nineties, and and I knew that guy. You know, he was a caricature, but but I yeah, I could I can think of three or four pubs that I went to, and they had a version of him in them. Mm. Which pub stereotype were you when you were a drinker? Uh, I was kind of life and soul, so I would drink too much, start singing, get other people involved. I'd be that prick, yeah. <laughs> But yeah, let's let's bring it back and uh, and summarize then. So, time, gentlemen, please. If you do want to watch it, Al Murray uh, has put all the episodes on his YouTube channel. Yeah, we'll link to that. That, that was great because you you know, the, I'm just for our listeners' benefit. The way this works is, Alan watches every episode that's ever been broadcast and every minute of every interview, <laughs> and then he says to me, "Here, try these," and he'll send four or five episodes over. And sometimes that's quite difficult. It's quite difficult to be able to see them all. But yeah, Al Murray's on his own personal YouTube page has put these all out, which I thought was interesting. I mean, just in terms of rights, how yeah, how, how have Sky let him do that? I don't know. I mean, it's possible they just bought the rights and Sky yeah. was like, whatever, have them. Because <laughs> uh, if they're not going to use them. I know, for example, Richard Herring and Stuart Lee bought Fist of Fun from the BBC mm. because they wanted to put it out on DVD and the BBC weren't going to do it. So they said, well, let us buy it. We'll buy it and we'll make the money back on the DVDs. I don't know if they made the money back. but Well, I, I mean, like, because Richard Herring tells everybody everything, I know they paid 70 grand for that. Oh, wow. Uh, and then that's, that's they did bad, make. Really. He, he said they did make their money back. So they, however many DVDs they sold, but I would imagine it would cost more than that to buy, just because of the volume of material uh, and how yeah. much. You know, uh, there were ads on on this these YouTube videos, but I don't know how much money he's making just by putting it out like that. Yeah, actually, this is something I meant to mention earlier, but just in terms of yeah, you're kind of the breadth of material there. There are 37 episodes of Time, Gentlemen, Please. So it was sort of 22 in the first series, 15 in the second series. Obviously, that's a lot more than you get in a typical British series. And I actually think that is a big factor. I think if they'd gone to these guys, write us six episodes, and then, oh, let's do a Christmas special. Okay, give us another six episodes. I think it would have been fine. They would have done it in a sort of more leisurely manner. They had enough material for 13 episodes. But I think with this many episodes, in a short space of time, particularly over a couple of years, it just spread it too thin. The ideas weren't there. And like I say, you just start seeing those corners get cut off, those kind of repeated gags tying mm. into previous episodes because it fills 30 seconds oh look let's get this character back from a previous thing because i already know how to write that character all those things that start to like lose away and mm. i think it's because there's too many episodes and for one writer basically yeah i'm a big fan of the character al murray the pub landlord mm. i have got a great deal an outpouring of affection for the other writer the other creative richard herring behind this project and yet I cannot stand time, gentlemen, please. It has got, <laughs> it, it, it's got nothing for me. <laughs> and it, it, it genuinely pains me to say it. <laughs> I might be slightly opposite, but not, not to an extreme. I definitely, I've always liked Al Murray's stuff. Uh, and I, I've, as we've talked about, I have perhaps a complicated relationship with Richard Herring. Hmm. But I have enjoyed his stuff. And I do enjoy time, gentlemen, please. I The first series anyway, certainly... There's enough there for me to enjoy it. You know, pub land more material. Uh, Julia Sawala is really a heart and soul of it. But I'm not going to sit here and say it's good. I'm not going to say it's a well put together sitcom. There's <laughs> there's so many elements that are slapdash. It's, you know, when we talked about One Foot in the Grave and about the yeah. business, constant business. That's mm. my, that's like my high bar standard now. And when yeah. I watch a sitcom like this, and it's just like every character is standing still waiting till it's their turn to say the line. It's a good observation. 
it's this, it's jumping out at me now. It's only because we watched One Foot in the Grave, <laughs> but it's jumping out at me. And there's some things you can get away with. Oh, it's naff, but we're doing it in a kind of naff style, so that's okay. And some things that are just a bit sloppy and crap. But ultimately, I, I enjoyed this. I would I would recommend the first series definitely. Yeah. I would say if you like Al Murray, watch it. Do you know what? I'm I'm really pleased to hear you say that because. <laughs> For all the reasons that it pained me to say I didn't like it, uh, you know, if everybody, if everybody that's listening to this, you know, tweeted us and said, "Gareth, you're an idiot," it's brilliant. Then I, I, I'd be quite happy about that because, <laughs> you know, I want to be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> And that is the end of the show and the end of our first series. We are strictly sitcom classic rules here, six episodes. Okay, yes, they were so long, we split them up into two each, 12 episodes, but we only looked at six sitcoms, and that is our series. We will return, do not fear. We'll be back in about three months in July with our second series. We've got a great slate of sitcoms lined up for you. And just to try and fill in the gap a little bit, we will be putting out some little bits and pieces, uh, such as uh, we did a kind of roundup quiz all about things we've learned in our first six episodes. So look out for that. That will be coming in the next few months, uh, as well as a few other little bonus things. But next full episode in July, do make sure you're there. In the meantime, come and join the conversation. We are on social media, at BritcomPod, on Instagram and Twitter. So go and check those out. If you've enjoyed the series, do uh, please uh, spread the word. Rate and review us on iTunes, um, all that sort of stuff. Anything you can do to help spread the show is great. And we thank you very much for listening. We'd also like to thank Tom O'Fallows, who did all the music you've heard on the show, our, our intro and the interstitial music and this sound bed that you're hearing under me right now. He did that as well. Big thanks to him. Thank you again, everyone, and we will be back very soon. <laughs>